Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on compensating for lead resistances in Spring Gauge applications. Your microphone will stay muted throughout the presentation. If you have questions, we will address them at the end of the presentation using the Q&A feature of WebEx. However, you're welcome to type in your questions at any time. Our presenter today is Bart Morick. Bart is an applications engineer at HBM with 27 years of experience in a variety of areas within the organization, including manufacturing, service, technical support, international support, sales, and application support of high-speed data acquisition systems and sensors. Bart, it's all yours. Thank you, Krista. Every string gauge measurement, irrespective of its type, is bound to have some sort of measurement error. To the extent to which the error can be limited depends on a variety of different solutions to correcting problems, be they in the data acquisition side to the application of the string gauge. This webinar is going to focus on one source of potential error, lead resistance issues, in the application of gauges, and we will save other issues for future webinars. There are a number of interfering influences on strain gauge that one should consider, including the mounting of the strain gauge. You need to consider the selection of the strain gauge type, the method that you're going to fix the gauge, uh, the measurement point protection, how good is the quality of the mounting of the strain gauge, your soldering and insulation. Then there's the issue of mechanical loading, or shock, impact, compression, uh, acceleration to the gauges, and then fatigue loading. Temperature, there are levels, changes, there's a rate of change in the active period at which it, the gauge is at various temperatures, exceeding the strain gauge limits. So you could exceed the temperature range of the gauge and the number of load cycles. Pneumatic and hydraulic effects. What kind of pressure and vacuum are the gauges seeing? Chemical effects. Are you seeing humidity, uh, water, chemicals, gases, bacteria affecting your strain gauges? Then there's also radiating fields. Neutron and gamma and X-ray radiation, electric and magnetic fields that could interfere with your measurements. Then there's component properties. Are you making measurements on soft materials or properties of concrete where the in there's inhomogeneities of the the material that you're working with? And then lastly, cable effects. So there's resistance, capacitance, and symmetry of the cable, surge impedance, insulation screening. Measuring points at bridges or aircraft wings are often located at great distances from the measuring instruments. With measuring points that are not directly accessible, measuring instruments need to be connected using long cables. The disadvantage to this is that lead resistance in the cable can amount to several ohms of additional resistance to the strain gauge and thereby negatively affect your measurement. All changes of resistance occurring within the bridge circuit have an effect on the bridge. The bridge circuit itself cannot distinguish between the resistance changes in the strain gauge and those in connecting leads which are connected in series with the strain gauge. Electrical resistance changes in the cable during a measurement due to temperature variations will also have a negative effect as the lead wire temperature changes can have a more detrimental effect on the measurement accuracy than temperature changes in the gauge itself. It is important to note that the resistance of the connecting lead reduces the measured value provided by the strain gauge. So, when making a strain gauge measurement, which should you use? Two wire, three wire, four wire? The easiest solution to make is a two wire connection into the Wheatstone bridge. With a two-wire two Wheatstone bridge connection, all the changes in resistance will be measured. It's easy to connect to your circuit, and it's the lowest cost solution. Here we find the standard strain gauge equation, which finds that the relative change of the resistance of the strain gauge is proportional to the strain applied. The gauge factor of sensitivity is expressed by the ratio of the relative change of resistance to the strain, and is represented by K, or the gauge factor. 
change in resistance divided by the original resistance of the strain gauge is equal to the gauge factor multiplied by the strain. Or strain is equal to the change in resistance divided by the original resistance. And then that value is divided by the gauge factor. However, with the two-wire connection, we must also consider the added resistance of the cables running from the strain gauge back to the completion circuit. The resistance can vary depending on length, gauge factor of the leads, temperature coefficient of the cable conductor material, etc. With a two-wire configuration, we see that there is a shift of the zero point that needs to be taken into account. Or that needs to take in the account of the resistance added by the leads. In a worst case scenario, let's say our lead wire adds 0 0.432 ohms per meter of length, and we have 10 meters of leads in a 20, 120 ohm quarter bridge configuration. Using the equation that we showed in the previous slide, we found that the amount of strain induced just by the 10 meters of cable would induce over 17,000 microstrain. Plugging this value into our secondary equation to calculate the amount of offset we will see, the amount of off output per volt of excitation, we find that the gauge factor of 2.03 and the 17,000 microstrain will give us a 9 millivolt per volt. HBM products have a variety of different ways of handling some of these issues. For the EDAC control package of TCE, we can use the lead wire resistance panel to have the software calculate the amount of lead resistance in the circuit and perform a correction. This can be manually calculated based on wire gauge and wire length. Using the back calculate resistance button, we apply excitation to the bridge, make a few measurements after applying shunt resistors to various arms of the bridge to determine what the lead resistance uh, wire the lead wire resistance actually is. This can then be manually entered into the do lead wire corrections field. Here are some encapsulated strain gauges from HBM, which come standard with a known cable length. The resistance of the strain gauge value is adjusted so that the entire resistance, including the cables, is 120 ohms. The gauge itself may be 119.2 ohms, but the resistance of the leads adds 0.8 an additional 0.8 ohms, so the total ends up being 120 ohms. You can get this in a standard linear, T rosettes, or 0, 45, and 90 degree rosettes. This specialty gauge eliminates some of the issues that we just talked about, but the cost of the gauges do go up significantly. We also need to consider the effects of temperature on the cable during a test. In this instance, we have one ohm of additional resistance from the cable leads of 2.3 meters and a cable or a change of temperature on the cable of 10 degrees. If we calculate the 10 degrees of change with the known temperature coefficient of the leads, we find that the lead wire change by itself is 160 microstrain, which would be much larger than the 10 degrees of change that the strain gauge itself sees when there is a 10 degree change. What this all ends up doing then is changing the actual gauge factor of the strain gauge. For example, adding in the extra resistance due to the leads, we can calculate that the gauge factor is actually different than what is on the strain gauge package. We find that our new resistance is now 120 ohms, 120 ohms plus the one ohm of lead resistance, and then using our strain gauge calculation and solving for our new gauge factor, we see that the value drops from 2.03 to 2.01, a 1% drop in the accuracy of the measured value. So in conclusion, adding extra cables causes a significant zero point shift. The change due to a temperature on the cable can be up to 16 times the temperature change of the gauge itself and the influence of the real gauge factor leads us to conclude that a two-wire connection should be avoided whenever possible. So the next option that we would have would be a wiring a quarter bridge strain gauge using the three-wire connection method. 
one more wire is used and then in the two wire connection but the changes in resistance of the cables will be compensated by the Wheatstone bridge. This is our equivalent circuit diagram. The resistance of the strain gauges, R1, and the lead resistance is balanced out by the addition of the completion resistor, R2, and the same amount of lead resistance provided by the third wire in our circuit. So with our effect on the zero point shift, everything balances out. The 10 meters of cable have the same effect on the strain gauge, R1, as it does on the completion resistor, R2. 2.16 ohms on the strain gauge, 2.16 ohms of additional resistance on the completion resistance gives us approximately 8,900 8, microstrain on one side and negative 8,900 microstrain on the other side, eliminating the zero point shift. In a two-wire quarter bridge, we saw the effect of heat to the cables. So let's take a few seconds here to watch an example of heat on a strain gauge cabling. In this case, we have three strain gauges wired in a two-wire, a three-wire, and a four-wire configuration along with the PT100 to monitor the temperature during um, the heating of the, of the cables. So we take a heat gun and expose the wire of the gauges, but not the gauges themselves, to increasing temperature. The gauges themselves are static, and you're not seeing a change in temperature of loading of any sort. Looking at the output of the measurement, we see that the gauge connected to the two-wire uh, bridge configuration is rapidly rising, while the three- and four-wire configurations are stable. This shows us that a two-wire configuration, the red trace, is not able to give us any usable information when making measurements over varying temperatures three and four wire configuration cables show that the signal was stable over a changing temperature range. So now here we can see how the specifics of a change in temperature of 10 degrees on the three wire cable. Again, following the math step by step, using the length of the lead cable and the temperature coefficient of the material, we find that it causes again a 160 microstrain change, but this time it's on both sides of the bridge, a positive and negative value on the strain gauge R1 and the completion resistor R2. Balancing this change out so that there is no temperature effect, which is seen in the video. The last thing that we want to discuss with a three wire configuration is the effect of the gauge factor of the strain gauge. The additional length of cable does cause a change in the gauge factor result, however. This loss in signal occurs due to the cable resistance and can be considered as a reduction in the gauge factor of the strain gauge. So the lead resistance adds 0.5 ohms to our strain gauge and solving for the equation, or solving the equation for K, we find that the value of K has now changed from 2.03 to 2.02, a 0.5% additional error that is caused by the addition of leads if not corrected. So in conclusion, a three-wire connection, we don't have to worry about the zero-point shift. We don't have to worry about the temp temperature variations on the lead wires, but since the gauge factor varies with cable length, we do need to consider this. But can we perform a shunt calibration to correct for this? The issue that we run into is this, is that in a two-wire or three-wire connection, you can have a voltage drop across the lead wires that will have to be corrected for in order to make accurate measurements. The voltage across the gauge will be the total voltage in the arm of the Wheatstone bridge minus the voltage drop across the cables. By balancing our amplifier, we can correct the offset error, but this doesn't correct the cumulative error in the gauge factor value that is included in the data sheet for your gauges. So a shunt calibration can be, be performed where we place a highly accurate known resistance in parallel to our strain gauge. A deflection is then measured, and we use the data acquisition system's error correction software to properly normalize the channel. If our strain gauge is 120 ohms and our shunt resistor is 86.6 K ohms, we end up with a change in resistance of the strain gauge of about 0.17 ohms. 
The software can then use our measured shunt calibration value to correct the gauge factor to include the value of the resistance caused by our leads. So a small part of the total resistance of the strain gauge will not vary with strain, the resistance due to the cable leads. Or in other words, the resistance of the connecting leads reduces the measured value provided by the strain gauge. In order to correct for this, we need to apply a different gauge factor in order to obtain accurate steering results. The solution for this is to remove the cable effects, and we need to maintain a constant voltage at the strain gauge to overcome the voltage drop along the lead resistances, the lead resistances through the use of sense lines. So a third way to make a measurement is through a four-wire quarter bridge circuit. This is available on some but not all of our HBM bridge amplifier options. The sense lines going directly to the strain gauge ensures that the excitation voltage does not see the drop in voltage that would normally be present on lead resistance. A known current flow flows through the strain gauge, and by doing this, we can correct for any zero point or sensitivity errors. This is available only in the HBM extended Kreuzer circuit. To see how an example of this can affect your measurements, we are taking the same two, three, and four wire configurations used previously in the temperature example, and are now modifying the lead resistance by pushing in and pulling on the leads to see what effect they have. In the two wire configuration, you can see that pressing in and pulling on the leads causes asymmetric changes in the leads. And the output reading is affected by this while the strain gauge itself is seeing no strain. In the three wire configuration, you see the same effect. However, in the four wire configuration, you can see that the changes in the leads do not affect the output at all. This is due to the additional sense lines in the patent and Kreuzer circuit available in some of our data acquisition systems. So a four wire configuration requires an extra cable and a special amplifier, but it does eliminate the zero point offset. A temperature change on the cables does not affect the measurement, and a change in the gauge factor because of leads does not occur and does not vary with long lead lengths. We found cable lengths of more than 500 meters are now possible. So in certain cases, an HVM amplifier with the possibility of four wire quarter bridge configurations can provide the most accurate measurements. So up to this point, we have focused on quarter bridge configurations and issues that you may need to consider. Many of these issues are lessened when using half or full bridge configurations. In this case, we have a half bridge configuration where the minimum number of wires required would always be three wires. As you can see, we are still faced with the cable resistance and the suggestions provided before are also relevant here. The full bridge circuit, on account of its favorable characteristics, larger measurement signals, automatic compensation of interference effect, etc., is the arrangement preferred for the use in transducer construction. It also has the advantages if the internal bridge wiring is short and symmetrical. All the cables will be identical in length and value. Typically, the resistance of the connecting wires is so small that it can be neglected and therefore requires no special consideration. So for every measurement that you're making, you have to decide what is necessary. Basically, there are three effects to be compensated for, the cable resistance, the cable temperature, and the temperature of the object. In this table here, you can see which, uh, which circuit compensates what. The two-wire configuration in a quarter bridge is resistance issues of the cable and temperature resistance of the cable and the temperature of the object you have to consider. With the three-wire configuration, you still have an issue with the cable resistance and uh, the temperature of the object. <clears throat> but in a four-wire configuration, you can compensate for the cable resistance, the temperature of the cables, and then the temperature of the cable, or the object itself, will be corrected for. In a half-wire configuration, you can do this in either three-wire, five-wire, or if you have the Kreuzer circuit, 
from HBM, you can do this in an eight wire circuit where you can see the results here. In the three wire, you still have to deal with the cable resistance and the temperature of the cables. A five wire with sense lines allows you to correct for the cable resistance and the temperature of the object. Then the eight wire is a special feature. Here the active strain gauge and the compensation gauge are both connected to the extended Kreuzer circuit. So this is sensible if the cable length from the instrument to the active strain gauge is different to the cable length from the instrument to the compensation gauge. In the pull bridge, a six wire configuration may be necessary instead of a half bridge with five wires for compensation of mechanical influences or electromagnetic interferences. At www.hbm.com, we offer a wide rate of, uh, range of downloadable textbooks, white papers, and videos that describe these issues in greater detail. Please feel free to email us, and we will send you links to get access to all of them. So in summary, there are multiple methods for connecting strain gauges two-wire, three-wire, and four-wire in the quarter bridge. Each of these methods have their pluses and minuses. The method chosen is dependent on your individual testing requirements. HBM provides many possible solutions and recommendations that will best fit your testing needs. So thank you very much for your time, and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Bart. Um, we did have a few questions come in as you were talking. Everyone, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A feature of WebEx. You can access it via the icon you see there up at the top of your screen. There should be a little slide down menu. If you don't see that icon, click on the down arrow at the right of that and you should see it appear. One question, is the three-wire technique for quarter bridge effective in compensating for temperature of the part under study or only temperature differences of cabling? Well, the part, the temperature of the part under study is going to see the, the temperature effect, and that is going to affect the material that it's attached to. So you don't want that to deal with that. It will have an effect on the cable, which has nothing to do with the stress or strain that the, the item is seeing. So basically you're trying to separate out temperature effects a cable is seeing right. in separately from the object. Exactly. What about the influence of cable capacitance? Uh, that's a good question. The cores of the cable form capacitors between one another. Um, if there is capacitive unsymmetry in the bridge circuit, it can lead to overdriving the amplifier since the amplitude of the signals we're measured is really small. So usually we recommend that you use a low capacitance cable of high quality and avoid unnecessary, unnecessarily long cables uh, when possible. So more information can be found in one of our textbooks in the introduction to measurements using strain gauges by Carl Hoffman. That's available as a download as a PDF on our website, or you can order it from our web shop. Someone's asking about um, using a strain rosette as opposed to a half bridge or full bridge. Would that be a completely different items, or can some of this information apply there too? No, it's, it, it applies the same because the strain rosette is usually it's either a two or a three wire. Um, or it's either two or three strain gauge situations. So it would be multiple strain gauges in the same location, and so they would each be individual quarter bridges. So the, the cabling would be identical uh, for each one of these. It's just that you have multiple gauges in a single location. Someone's asking for clarification that all of this assumes AC excitation of the bridge. No, um, actually a couple of our this is the HBM um, quantum and NGC plus amplifiers has AC, AC excitation or uh, DC excitation. Our other systems, the EDAC and the, the Genesis high speed product, provide only DC excitation and, and these general outlines are applicable there as well. All right. 
Any other questions? Our email address is there. Oh, one came in. In conventional strain gauge conditioning, when there's a momentary open in the circuit, the output will go to either high or low, depending on which leg is open. Then when the circuit closes again, it returns to the proper level without very much overshoot. With the cruiser system, will the output, will my output overshoot to the opposite limit until it stabilizes again? Uh, the, the cruiser circuit, it's... <sighs> That, that is an interesting question. I think I'd like to follow up with one of our other people on that because there is a measurement where we're measuring the current through the circuit. And so when you have an open situation, um, it is going to go off scale, but I'm not sure the exact details on that. So I'd like to follow up with that one. All right, we will do that. Can you explain why or when you would use AC excitation as opposed to DC? Again, it depends on your and your application. Um, there are a variety of different needs, and depending on the the type of system that you have and the amount of lead resistance that you have and the circuitry involved, um, I've, we've got a white paper that we can send you on kind of the pluses and minuses of both. All right. Well, everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. And Bart, thank you. Our email address is there on the screen. So if you do think of something as soon as you disconnect from the meeting and want to follow up with Bart, you can reach him there. I will distribute Bart's presentation to everyone. Have a good afternoon, everyone.